1915 Beyond Reflections of Wars and Genocides and the Brutality of War. For those of you who know who I am, my name is Julian McBride. I'm a forensic anthropologist. Um, <laughs> so um, this event was brought together by myself um, primarily because I use art therapy. Art therapy is a therapeutic practice of expressing yourself to um, pretty much meditate PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder is anything that could trigger or bring forth um, prior traumas and genocide or just war in general. It could be a sexual assault victim, um, you could, pretty much domestic violence, a veteran, anybody could have PTSD. And my goal is to shed light on PTSD through art as a form of expressing yourself rather than communicating. Acknowledgements, um, 1915 and beyond is dedicated to all the victims of war who perished in large scale massacres and genocides. And to survivors who have never held their stories told in history. History is always written by the victors, but this time history will be written by the victims. Just before I start, this presentation does include some graphic images that I've drawn including images I've brought forth from the, from the internet. If you don't wish to continue because they may seem graphic, you could leave the chat. No one's penalizing you. Um, just a heads up that they could be very triggering for anybody who has a uh, trauma. Okay. Art therapy is a form of psychotherapy. It helps with PTSD, mental distress, disabilities, disease. People who have Alzheimer's use art therapy all the time. It gives them a sense of remembrance of their past. Uh, 1940, it was brought forth to the United States by Adrienne Hill and her doctor, doctorate, Art Versus Illness, brought forth art therapy to the United States. What is genocide? Genocide is an attempt and part of whole to completely wipe out a nationality ethnic group. It could be cultural, such as destroying ancient relic shrines like we saw ISIS do in Syria and Iraq the past five years, or it could be full-fledged genocide, such as against the Armenians, Jews, Bosniaks, and currently the Rohingya in Myanmar. Here are universally recognized genocides, such as the Holocaust, Rwanda genocide, and Bosnian genocide. Genocides that aren't universally recognized due to politics and geopolitics, Native American genocide, Assyrian Greek Armenian genocide, Holdemar, which took place in Ukraine, and genocide of the Congolese under King Leopold, which is something that's rarely talked about in history. This is my first drawing that pretty much got me into art therapy. I did this under Professor R.G. Alger Rockus as an independent study when I presented at University of Memphis. This is a Greek veteran who was decapitated. Um, his body was severed, but his on uh, doing anthropological research, Professor R.G. Algerakis and Professor Notis Algerakis found the body and the head of this veteran were able to match it up and retell his story. In the 14th century, during the Ottoman conquest of Greece, this veteran uh, was a commander in a fort called Polystylon in Western Thrace, which is located at the Red Star. Over 20 years, the fort was besieged by Ottoman forces. The veteran suffered a jaw wound, as you can see during the curve right here on his chin. Uh, they were able to fix him up through uh, medical surgery and he still led the defense. Eventually when the fort fell, he suffered a brutal head wound to the head right here. Most likely a large scale weapon such as an arrow or battle ax and his cranium was completely crushed. Afterwards, his body was decapitated. But I'm going to continue the story through the second slide. When his body was decapitated, it was actually a, a way to mock Christians as a way because early Christian practices basically said, if your body wasn't whole, you couldn't go to heaven. So that body was decapitated post-mortem and separated from his body. But the people, the uh, citizens of Polystylon who survived the siege, they were able to place the head towards east of Greece, which is very, very crucial 
east of Greece is Jerusalem and the Levant region. And that represented that his head was facing towards the kingdom of heaven, as an early Christian practice were to say. Eventually, Professor Algerakis and Professor Notus Algerakis found the severed head of the ancient veteran and his body in the early 90s. And I presented research through their guidance at NCUR over this veteran. And this is what got me into art therapy originally. This is the third century skull of an ancient Roman who actually had uh, surgery right here to relieve swelling on the top of his head from a fort. This veteran was actually located in a fort that belonged to King Philip of Macedon, but was then inhabited by the Romans. So that also showed early Greek migration into Italy before the Roman conquest of the Mediterranean. And the swelling right here was relieved uh, to the back of the head, as you can see the two round bald spots of his head of medical swelling. This also got me into medical anthropology as well and practices that involved it. These, um, some of my favorites because these are Armenian women during the Hamidian massacres, if they were programs against Armenians, Assyrians, and Greeks located in Asia Minor by Sultan Abdul Hamid II after military losses in both the Balkans and the Russians. He took out his anger on the second class citizens of Asia Minor, which were the Christian population. Some, some of them took, became militia, militias, took up militias and took up arms against the Ottomans. Overall, two to 400,000 Christians were killed during the programs, but these two ladies actually ended up surviving. One of them on the right is actually Derek Sherinian, a world famous musician, that's his great grandmother. So because of the fact that she survived the programs, he was able to live today. And this is Dangerous Nationalism, which one of my favorite captions that I've ever done. It's okay to be a nationalist, but it's not okay to be a blind nationalist. Because you, under blind nationalism believes that no matter what, your government is never wrong. And you believe anything your government were to tell you. This is one of the main problems in history and why genocides happen is because the government will largely blame a minority ethnic group for their problems rather than blaming themselves. And if you do enough propaganda between media, uh, racial discrimination, anything is bound to happen, including the worst things. These were two Armenians who were executed by the Ottoman government right before the genocide. And there are very, very much parallels in history where you saw 1939, Jews were out late, banned, boycotted in Berlin, which ended up becoming the Holocaust. In Rwanda, you saw mass, like early massacres and hatred against Tutsis by the Hutu-like government. The UN stood by, did nothing. And right now in Myanmar, Rohingya pretty much have been expelled from their homelands. Atrocities against the Syrians, as you can see, this is a seven-year-old Assyrian girl starved to death alongside her siblings. Dehydration and mass starvation was a primary method of execution during the 1915 genocides. Continued as well, Sefo is the Assyrian name of what they call the genocide. Sefo means sword. A primary method during the genocide was cutting people in half with swords. And that's how Assyrians remember it, that they were butchered to death and no one came to help them. And this world is never really black and white. It's always gray. There is no good side in anything. A lot of times in history, you'll see, you'll see, hey, the Americans, they helped liberate the Jews, they saved the Holocaust. Believe it or not, about 80% of US companies were actually collaborating with the Nazi government. Volkswagen, which is still sold in the US today, was a major component and of the Holocaust along with the Vatican as well. So this world is not always black and white where you say, this is a good side, this is a bad side. Right now we go, our government portrays us as a good morally right when it comes to military action, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, 
But if you were to ask the average citizen what they think about US military occupation and bombings, it would be the complete opposite. And these were crucified Armenian women. I'm just gonna forward, forward this. This is wartime sexual assault rate. I'm just gonna fast forward this image real quick, but I'm basically gonna explain how women were actually sold as slave markets a lot of times during the Ottoman period in Damascus, which is a main hub for where women were sold off as sex slaves and concubines to military officials. During Cyprus napalming, not sure if anybody knows the history of Cyprus, but overall, it wasn't just an ethnic conflict between Greece and Turkey. A lot of it had to do with both the United Kingdom and US interference in Cyprus, which raised tensions in the island to a boiling point. For example, the Cyprus napalming of, I mean, the Turkish napalming of Cyprus was largely sanctioned by the United Kingdom at the time, which didn't want to relinquish the island at all. The UK considered Cyprus an island as an unsinkable aircraft carrier, which is still a term used to this day. Cyprus is the main hub for any military air force to conduct operations in the Middle East, especially in the early 50s, 60s, and 70s during the height of the Arab-Israeli wars where the US and UK were highly, highly involved in the Middle East. This is a Syrian refugee. Not sure if anybody remembers the real actual image of Omran, who was displayed throughout 2016, but an airstrike hit over his home and he never cried at all. Um, it's mainly because he was so desensitized to the violence that, you know, it's just, it was a norm. And it just makes me think how much we take advantage of our privileges here. We go, we wake up, we brush our teeth. We get to enjoy our lives, we go to the park, we go to museums, and we go to bed, we have four walls and a roof over our head. About one fourth of the Syrian population doesn't have a roof over the head. They're literally laying in mud right now. Refugee camps are just so bad. They're facing abuse, um, stereotypes by a uh, far right nationalist saying all refugees are quote unquote rapists or monsters. And these are just kids that just want to find a home that they should be in school right now, enjoying their lives. Childhood and teenager and your teenage years are the best years of your life that you'll never get back. And kids like Omran, all they're going to remember are these bad memories. And this is really not fair. That's why I just say never take advantage of where you are, or where you came from. I'm gonna go away from war, but I just wanna talk about trauma, especially domestic violence. This is a picture of Nicole Simpson. This is actually the first drawing I ever did. It took me about two months, as you could tell, because I try to make it perfect. But I just wanted to show how like, trauma is just really, really deep and powerful. Everyone knows the, the OJ Simpson trial and how the family never received justice. But I just wanted to show somewhat of an image. The real image isn't displayed, but in my mind, I displayed what Nicole Simpson's final moments of her life looked like before rigor mortis and post mortem. Now, this is a wounded Iraqi girl, 2003. Her father was abused by US Marines. She just wanted to go hug her father, but she couldn't. Her father was detained and beaten right in front of her. And this was one of the main, main reasons why a lot of Iraqis took up arms against the U.S. occupation. When you, there's one thing when the United States says Saddam is a bad man, but when you start abusing the citizens just like Saddam did, you're just bringing them into a whole nother nightmare. And this is um, an Afghan airstrike. This was a German Afghan strike in Afghanistan and Kunduz province in 2015. Approximately 90 to 100 people were killed when the German Air Force accidentally hit oil tankers, which is right by a nearby village. Over 300 to 400 Afghans suffered third degree burns. 150, 200 plus civilians were killed in these raids. To this day, Germany has never really gave reparations for this airstrike, but this was one of the main 
turning points in the war in Afghanistan, which also ironically happened about three months before President Obama uh, announced a troop surge, which is about an extra 50,000 troops in Afghanistan, which is when public opinion really, really changed during the war. This is my personal favorite drawing because I call it a cycle of violence. And I just want everybody to hear what a cycle of violence really is. So overall, this is a nine-year-old child. I'm gonna keep this on the screen because I just want everyone to display, just imagine what it's like to be a Yemeni right now. So this nine-year-old got on his bus, was on his way to school, just minding his own business. Airstrike hits the bus, kills all the kids. The families come, they dig up the body parts of their children. It was a Saudi Arabian, it was an airstrike by Saudi Arabia, but the missiles were made in the United States. So you pretty much have the United States backing a very, very theocratic and brutal regime which killed their children. These same parents, locals, you're going to take up arms in frustration against Saudi Arabia and the United States, which in turn, sometimes it'll lead to terrorist attacks here or terrorist attack or attacks at our diplomatic stations abroad. Now the military industrial complex here and, pol and hawkish politicians will use this as an excuse to continue bombing, more military interference and interventions in the Middle East. Now you just have one big full cycle of violence continuing and continuing that's nearly endless. And I just want to display this because right now the United States is concerned, right now is considered to be in an endless war. Afghanistan is considered endless. As of last week, President Biden authorized an extra 4,000 troops in Iraq over high intentions with Iran. So right now that's looking like an endless conflict. And right now we have no exit strategy in Syria. And that could pretty much be another endless conflict for the United States. Sins of the father, each year Africa suffers tribal tensions and conflicts. A lot of people think it's just, oh, it's just African problems, it's just African tensions. A lot of it was divisions created during the colonial era. How, how did European powers conquer these nations? It was easy. It was a divide and conquer method. For example, if you go to Rwanda, the Belgians backed the Tutsis over the Hutus originally. And here's why. According to Belgians, Tutsis were lighter skinned black people. They had smaller noses. They had more elegant lips. So they demonized another section of the population, the Hutus, and gave the Tutsis a little bit more privileges, but didn't treat them the same way they would treat the average Belgian. So that divide and conquer already works right there to where you don't have to send a full-fledged military to do your work in Africa you pretty much turn the locals against each other. And to this day, a lot of these conflicts are born from this div these divide and conquer methods. And child soldiers, I can't express this enough to this day, child trafficking is one of the biggest things in the world and using children amongst war is still used to this day. ISIS used Cubs of the Caliphates, the Lord Resistance Army led by Joseph Coney was a known full children army, kidnapped children. We see it all the time, even during the height of the Latin American wars, children were used in conflicts. And it's just something that needs to end. Children deserve to have their own life of their own. And it's just a shame that it comes to this. Okay, so this is a woman who was post-mortem burned during the firebombing of Dredden? Uh, Allied forces, both the United States and the UK, decided that Germany, uh, particularly the city of Dresden, which, uh, which was a military hub, that they just wanted to destroy the city outright. Even though there were military targets there, they knew that there were over 25 plus civilians trapped in the city. But instead of just using regular munitions to bomb the city, they used napalm outright, napalm and incendiary weapons. 
And a lot of them, they use oxygen bombers. If you don't know what oxygen bombers are, they light the air on fire. So during the height of the two to three day bombing of Dresden, the oxygen was so hot, it was close to about 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which only a nuclear bomb could be hotter than that. So a lot of people, not only did they die painfully, they also died by inhaling the oxygen, which burned their internal organs and lungs. Uh, massacres of Nanking, the Nanking Massacre, which was Imperial Japan over a brutal, brutal period during the occupation of then the capital of the Republic of China, outright slaughtered J uh, Chinese civilians, primarily for sport, which was even covered in Japanese media, looting, fires, uh, burning people alive, burying people alive cutting people of katanas, and even killing babies, which was considered a sport. Japanese officers were actually promoted just for the number of kills they would have as civilians that were left behind. And to this day, one of the reasons why Japan and China have so much tension is because Japan never fully apologized or paid reparations for the massacre of Nanking. This is a Syrian Arab soldier. Um, he was beheaded by ISIS, and I just wanted to show that um, people who are fighting for their homelands right now, a lot of us, we take advantage of where we are. It's one thing to be here, you know, defending your home from a burglar. These people are defending their homes from not only a terrorist group like ISIS, but multiple militaries, multiple armies around the world. And you see innocent Syrian soldiers who just want to go back home to their families. They're caught in this crossfire of this never-ending cycle of violence. And here we have an allied soldier who is from Belgium who is helping a Germite, German shoulder, soldier. Sorry, And I, just, I call this caption Brotherhood Without Borders because at the end of the day, the young people are always fighting a rich man's war. We've seen that happen all the time. Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, they put emphasis on things like this where you have 17, 18-year-olds 18, 18 dying all the time while the rich politicians, they drink their expensive bottles of champagne, eat steak and lobster while someone else is fighting their war for them. And this was the Great Famine of Mount Lebanon. This was actually a precursor to the 1915 genocides of Armenians, Greeks, and Assyrians. For those who don't know, the Great Famine of Mount Lebanon is considered the fourth genocide of the Ottoman Empire. During World War I, the French had a naval blockade against the Ottoman Empire in the Mediterranean. And the only way food could get into Lebanon was through Syria. The governor of Syria at the time was called Dijamal Pasha. He was nicknamed the Bloodthirsty. And he purposely halted food in Lebanon, Mount Lebanon, for two reasons. One, to blame the French overall of the impending starvation. And two, at that time, Mount Lebanon was autonomous. A lot of Mount Lebanon population was made up of Maronite Christians, and they were autonomous under French autonomy rule. So this was the Ottoman Empire's way of getting back at France as well. Over four to 500,000 Lebanese, mostly Maronites, were starved to death. They largely had to rely on grass, wheat, dirt, even eating their own cannibalism, pets. It was just a really, really horrible, horrible time period. And what a lot of people don't realize is that Lebanon per capita had the highest casualty rate in World War I. They lost over 50% of their population during the Great Famine. And well, if you'd like to stay connected or need any historical references, you could email me. I'm going to keep the screen up for a little bit. For those who don't know, I am the new assistant editor of the academic academia section of the Middle East Journal. It's going to be called Nor Media. We're launching May 1st. I'll be in charge of history anthropology, archaeology, and geopolitics of the Middle East. So you'll be seeing a lot of articles coming out of me in early May. 
I'm also an independent journalist. I plan on flying to different countries who are facing civil strife around the world. Lebanon, Cyprus, Ethiopia, Yemen, Armenia, China, Mali, Libya, even Myanmar. Hopefully I could be there, even though there's a military junta right now. Latin America, such as Chile, Venezuela, Brazil. And I plan on doing this through self-funding. I just opened a Patreon page. Uh, my link is right here and black and white. You could just Google um, Patreon and look up my name, Julian McBride, or nickname, Julian Anthropology. I'm also on Academia. You can read my publications on academia.edu. 